Welcome back, everyone. As we shift focus from politics now to all things legal and the return of our Wednesday Dream Team of Attorneys here tonight, Jimmy Casuris, criminal defense attorney in Manhattan, lectures at New York Law School and a visiting professor, as I like to say, at the University of Birmingham in England. Doug Von Oyce, founding partner of Carson Von Oyce, focusing on corporate misconduct. We'll be talking about that tonight. He also selected as the legal 500 as one of the five most, uh, 500 most influential attorneys in the nation. And Mark Furnish, constitutional lawyer who's argued before the high court and a professor now at Brooklyn Law and that in fact is where we're going to start with a high court decision today. Speaking of constitutional law, we got a major ruling for the Supreme Court this morning on campaign contribution limits in a case known as McCutcheon. Now the justices in their first 5-4 ruling this session along as you'd expect ideological lines here with Kennedy with the majority of course threw out the total limits that any one person can contribute to federal candidates, people running for the House, Senate, or the White House. Here's how the decision breaks down. Court left in place the $2,600 limit on how much any one person can give to any one candidate for both the primary and the general election. But they threw out a cap on the total those individual contributions can add up to. That cap, close to $49,000, meant that one person could only give maximum contributions to 18 candidates. Now they can give the maximum to everyone running for office if they so choose. And the court also threw away the limit on how much a single person can give to a political party committee like the DNC or the RNC. Now, I'll give you two opinions to give you an idea on why they felt this way. Speaking for the majority, the Chief Justice, uh, John Roberts, said, um, citing the First Amendment as the reason he overturned the campaign limits, quote, there's no reason in our democracy more basic than the right to participate in electing our political leaders. But Justice Stephen Breyer, speaking for the dissent, warned of the danger of money in politics, saying, quote, if the court in Citizens United opened a door, today's decision may well open a floodgate. Mark, I ask you, A, were you surprised um, in the ruling? Um, and talk about some of the consequences. We've had this debate here since Citizens United about not just the role of money that's always been there, but now the new way that money can funnel its way into our political process. Well, it's sort of back to the future. It's, it's not really a new way. It's back to the old way, the right. pre-Buckley Vallejo way in the early 70s. I don't, I don't think this is necessarily the sequel to Citizens United. That's a corporate case uh, about spending. This is a case about individuals' right to make contributions, not to a particular candidate, but to uh, a, a number of candidates. And I think what this decision has done is shown the current court's view uh, that the cornerstone uh, of campaign finance regulation is what they're calling the basic limit, the $2,600 uh, limit, which as you noted at the outset is still in play here. Uh, but but that's really the 800 pound gorilla. But let's be honest, if we wanted to influence a race, you and me, we could do what the Koch brothers and the sources of the world have done here, forgetting your ideologies. You could create a pack, you can create whatever you want and basically throw as much money without any uh, even um, transparency as to what you're doing or how much you're doing it through basically a third party here and you just put money in the process. Now, you don't even have to go through that pretense. You write a check to the RNC or the DNC and you say, I'm giving you a check for 10 mil. And you, these, which races I want you to put it in, they'll put it directly in there. You don't even have to go around to find a third way to do it now. Well, the majority opinion written, written by Roberts for the court says that there are other restrictions that, that uh, impose transparency on that process so that the public and people like you will know uh, what the PACs are doing, what the committees are doing, and to whom they're funneling uh, the money. And that, he says... You can uh, still do it, though. Yes, you can still do it, but... The answer to that, according to the majority, is a watchdog press and an informed citizenry. To me, the interesting thing is what's going to happen to this $2,600 limit yeah. because you have uh, Thomas already saying that he would scrap it already. Uh, Speaking for the majority, he went even more yes. here. He said there should be no limits at all here. It should basically be the Wild West here. Do whatever you want, write whatever check you want to whoever you want here with no restrictions whatsoever. So. Doesn't it just mean that whoever's got the most money is more likely to win? I and mean, we know that's the truth to begin with. And now it's just the, making it easier yeah. to... Yes. I agree. In practical terms, to me, the system is so broken that this is just moving in deck chairs around on the Titanic. I, you know what? Uh, unfortunately, I think Mark's right on this one. But it, we're starting to see more and more... There are issue candidacies, issue races, where instead of voting for the person, now 
you want to have fracking as the issue in a particular area, you want to talk about uh, some uh, controversial plant that they're going to go into wherever else, that'll be the issue now even more than the candidates. It's now become um, more about groups and organizations on the side rather than the parties or even the people. I, I, I well, think to me this this makes it even easier for the two big parties to raise more and more yes. money. We've never needed a third or a fourth or a fifth party in this country more than we do right now, and this makes it almost impossible right. to have that because right. it, it it consolidates power yep. in, in the majority leaders for each party um, to disperse the funds. Real quickly here, um, the Supreme Court uh, case we're waiting on here, but they've agreed to hear it. It's based in upstate New York in the town of Greece. It's near Rochester. Two women suing the town because official town meetings here frequently begin with explicitly Christian prayers, often referring to Jesus Christ on the cross. When the case was heard in November, justices seemed to have difficulty determining whether to place where to place a line on overly religious invocations. Is there such a thing as a clean li a clear line as to where it is and where it isn't? I mean, we even deal with this at the beginnings of ball games or, uh, you know, even uh, in the federal uh, officials under God, you know, is it clear where the it's line not, is or is it, it always not, vague? It's not clear. It's very vague. The Establishment Clause uh, case law, beginning with this uh, case called Lemon versus Kurtzman, it's often said that lemon is a lemon. <laughs> uh, you can't make heads or tails out of it. No, seriously. can't make heads or tails of it, but this isn't going to be the case where they clean it up because the case is largely governed by a 1983 precedent, Marsh versus Chambers, that upheld a virtually identical practice. That said, the case has been out for a very long time. I thought this was open and shut. It's been five or six yeah. months already, so who knows what's going to happen. All right. When we come back here, um, I want to get the uh, panel's take on the GM case. The head of GM um, gets grilled on Capitol Hill for the second straight day today over the faulty ignition switches. Our legal panel is going to explain how GM could end up paying not only a huge price for its negligence here, but how they figure out how much they're on the hook for. We'll talk about that after this.